Oculus, what are we trying to do? So our goal as a company is that over the next 10 years, we want to uh, have 1 billion people be engaged regularly in virtual reality. And virtual reality, as we talk about it today, is, is really just a seed of what we see virtual reality becoming. We're very excited about the possibilities. And when we talk about connecting and helping people experience VR across a billion people, we're not just talking about the people in this room, we're talking about old people, young people. We're talking about people across various different geographies, social backgrounds, economic backgrounds, languages. Hopefully at some point in the future, planets. We'll find out. So how does that manifest? We have a couple of different channels or, or uh, form factors for Oculus VR. The first of which is PC. Everyone's very familiar with the PC product. The DK1, which launched just at the end of, uh, or just at the beginning of 2013, was our first public developer kit. And PC has some interesting advantages. Obviously, you have a very powerful PC that you can draw upon for power, uh, sensor data, compute, uh, GPU, uh, graphics processing. So the PC is sort of the tip of the spear. It's where all of our research tends to focus in terms of emerging uh, new capabilities and, and new features. The mobile product that we recently announced is uh, a fundamentally different product. The thing that it offers that's, that's the nicest is that it's, very, uh, it's a very accessible form factor. You put it on, you're not tethered to a box, and uh, it, it does concede the positional tracking right now, but uh, our team, led up by John Carmack, is focused on bringing capabilities such as positional tracking to mobile. And if you think about where we've come from, uh, think for a moment as an example of the DK1. So that was March, April of 2013. And now in, uh, you know, the before winter of this year, which is less than two years later, we're releasing Gear VR with our partner Samsung. Gear VR, if you compare it to DK1, is 2.5K resolution versus 720p resolution on DK1. It has low persistence versus full persistence on DK1 and uh, many other software features that make it a supremely more comfortable and exciting experience. And so why that's important is because the waterfall of features from PC to mobile is at about a two year or maybe a little bit less than two year rate. And so is there anyone who has seen Crescent Bay in the room? Okay, if you've seen Crescent Bay, then you know which direction mobile is going over the course of the next couple of years and that's very, very exciting. Um, So here we go. We have now, after DK1, obviously, we've released DK2 as well. And DK2 added a few things to the original DK1. It added a 1080p resolution display panel. It added um, full positional tracking, six degrees of freedom. And then Gear VR, as I've just spoken about, has uh, pretty advanced resolution and uh, very, very high frame rate. At 60 frames per second, we have uh, full low persistence. So over the past two years, we've been working primarily on um, providing features and resources and, and services for developers. And uh, you, you've probably noticed that our developer center and our share platform, which is our, um, our platform for sharing content and, and uploading and downloading new VR applications, it's all been very developer oriented. And we're sort of in the middle where we've got a developer who wants to share something and we've got the developers on the other side who are looking for access to uh, applications that people have created. And we're sort of right here in the middle creating the platform to establish those types of relationships. The way that, uh, oh and by the way, this is a uh, screenshot of Share, which is our application platform. And this is the early backbone of what we're going to be using for consumerization of content. Thus far, it's, it's been hugely successful. But what's happening in the future is we're going to expand the reach so that 
developers can finally reach users. And this is the question that people almost always ask within the first three questions. How and when can I sell my content to developers? And so right now, we have the free store. And the free store for consumers will launch along with Gear VR later this year, before Christmas. Once we, once we get the free store launched and, and get the users actually engaged at the consumer level, then we will build upon that same platform to create a commerce channel. And that will come online in a, in a number of months after the uh, free store ships with GearVR. GearVR is exciting because it includes Oculus Home. Oculus Home is our VR portal. It's a clean, simple interface. It allows you to see different apps, look at reviews, review content. Uh, we haven't talked about everything that, that the Oculus Home uh, platform will be capable of, but you can get a sneak peek if you actually head over to Paris Games Week. You can see Gear VR there, or if you have an appointment with us. And if you don't already, then it's too late to set up one. I'm a, I apologize. But uh, if you already have an appointment, we can show you Gear VR over in our booth as well. So beyond virtual reality, we're also providing access to resources so that people with an application or at their desktop or laptop can browse and purchase and engage on the content side. So we've announced that we will have a browser store as well as our native application. And then, obviously, Oculus Home provides that same interaction in a VR environment. So let's talk about virtual reality technology. We'll get, we'll get past all of the business and get straight into the nitty gritty with uh, the developer topics. How does virtual reality work? So virtual reality begins with motion. Someone has a headset on their face and they move their head, and we engage the tracker. The tracker is sampling at 1,000 hertz, and that serves as our input. So these on top here, you've got sort of the linear path, and then down here, I've just got some graphics. It's basically the same message. From the tracker, we pass through USB to provide the sensor data, which is processed at the CPU level to provide the ultra-responsive orientation and positional tracking that you need to create a comfortable VR experience. And then we push all of the data out to, through the GPU to write the uh, image buffer. And between the time that we're writing with the GPU and the time that you actually see the photon in your eyeball, we have pixel switching on the display panel, which means that in between uh, each frame, so let's say that you've got 60 frames per second, every single one of those frames has a certain amount of pixel switching time. It used to be that this was about 15 to 16 milliseconds of pixel switching time on the LCD panels, which is why as you turned your head with a DK1, the whole world would sort of blur and smudge, and then when you stopped turning, it would look clear again. However, with DK2 and with Gear VR, we now have low persistence mode, which has roughly a two to three millisecond pixel switching time, which is imperceptible to the human eye. However, what that requires is that you run at a very high frame rate. For Gear VR, that's 60 frames per second. For Crescent Bay, that's 90 frames per second. DK2 is 75 frames per second. And people who are interested in Crescent Bay are always asking, what can I do? How can I, how can I make sure that my game is going to be ready or my experience is going to be ready for the consumer version? Uh, and we always tell them, what you need to do is develop on DK2 and make sure that, if required, you would be able to run at a constant 90 frames per second. If you can get to that point, you're in very good shape for what we're going to require for consumer version one. So let's talk about the technology behind making this loop possible. And we know that the total latency loop from motion to photon that we're aiming at is about 20 milliseconds. So let's break it down. First of all, good VR requires good tracking. If you don't have good tracking, if you don't have responsive tracking, if you don't have full six degrees of freedom for PC or the three degrees of freedom for Gear VR with appropriate design for your content, it's not going to be comfortable. The nice thing is, is that with Crescent Bay and for consumer version, we'll have full 360 degree tracking. So with Crescent Bay, we added new micro LEDs to the back of the head that allow you to turn completely around without losing tracking at all. We have sub-millimeter accuracy, which is really incredible if you think about standing four, five, six feet away from a camera to have sub-millimeter accuracy 
with full range of motion. It's just really incredible how all of the new sensor technology and the very talented software engineers that we have have made that possible. And then also, you have to have a comfortable tracking volume. One of the enhancements between DK2 and Crescent Bay is an expanded tracking volume, where in DK2, I think what we'll end up doing years down the road is we'll look back and say, remember how we used to have to fit our faces into a triangle of space? Uh, and that will go away over time. The second component that's required is low latency. So less than 20 milliseconds motion to photon for the complete rendering loop. And then what we're doing is fusing optical tracking and our own custom IMU to make that happen. We also need to make sure that we're minimizing the loop from tracker to CPU, GPU to display, and then ultimately through to photons. The nice thing is there's no latency that's incurred with the optic system. So we can just leave that out. Persistence, low persistence. As I mentioned, about three milliseconds, two to three milliseconds for uh, persistence on the display panel. What we're doing is turning on and off the display quickly. So we'll render for a few milliseconds, blank until the new image is, is offered, and then blit it to the screen for another few milliseconds. So 90 plus uh, frames per second refresh rate is required in order to avoid flicker. Resolution, this is an exciting one. One of the benefits that we have as a VR community, not just Oculus, but anyone who's involved in VR, is that there are industries who are motivated to solve a lot of the problems that we depend upon. Fast GPU compute, fast CPU compute, sensor arrays and systems, new technologies that are going to allow us to expand what VR means. And display resolution is one of those problem, problems that's being solved for us for free. We didn't have to go to Samsung and say, we really think you should create a 4K display. They're already creating 4K display, as a matter of fact, People were starting to ask questions, why do we care about 4K display? And we provided the answer. Well, we're going to magnify it, and we're going to put it right in front of your face. So actually, we'd prefer to have 8K. Can you make that happen? Sure, we'll make that happen. So a lot of these companies are very happy and excited, just as we are, that there is a new impetus for uh, the maturation of these different industries. There's a reason to invest in R&D. There's a reason to uh, advance the technology, and that's very exciting. Uh, I think that... If you've seen Crescent Bay, you'll, you'll observe that the pixel structure is increasingly difficult to, to make out. So between DK1, which had sort of the screen door effect, and DK2, there was definitely a, a reduction in the pixel structure observance, but uh, not completely. And with Crescent Bay, I think we're getting very close to the point to where you cannot see the pixels anymore. It'll get even better. Optics, optics are very important. And this is one of the things that makes VR possible now or realistic now where it wasn't before. Most of the fields of view of previous virtual reality products were more in the range of 30 to 60 degrees. So this is really one of the differentiating factors when we launched the first DK1 and launched our Kickstarter to, to start the company. We had a field of view that was about 100 degrees horizontal, which was just unheard of, and especially at a $300 price point. We're replacing virtual reality systems that were $10,000, $20,000 with something that is basically a cell phone smart or a smartphone uh, display panel and a custom IMU. So you need to have a comfortable, high, comfortable eye box and high quality calibration and correction. So across a wide field of view, obviously, there's a lot of interplay with the optic system as well because you're introducing distortion. And so across that field of view, you want to be able to, in the long run, be able to move your eyes so that you don't have to focus directly forward. And um, so calibrating between software, hardware capabilities and the optic system is really important to do correctly. If you don't, it might not necessarily be that observable. However, people will get sick and they won't know why. So when we put all of these things together, it results in presence. Presence is the ultimate goal of virtual reality. Presence is what allows you to put on an Oculus Rift headset and forget that you're in a room, or forget that you're in a car, or forget that you're at someone's house. This didn't happen with DK1. Someone argue, some would argue it doesn't even happen with DK2. With Crescent Bay, I think it happens. Uh, for, for me, myself, uh, the very early prototype of Crescent Bay that I saw was the first time that I had a guarantee, a personal guarantee, that joining Oculus was the right decision, long term. When I first joined, the, fir the only thing I had seen was the DK1, and it made me incredibly sick. However, I knew that there was promise. I knew that there was promise. I actually knew uh, before it was announced that we were talking to John Carmack and that he was very serious about joining. 
And so I put a lot of skin in the game, but without the guarantee that virtual reality really was going to be different this time than in the 80s or the 90s. And when I saw the very first Crescent Bay prototype, I had this moment where I realized this is real. This is really going to happen. This is really going to change the world. This is going to establish new industries, new ways of interacting with people. And uh, so presence really is kind of what we're all about. And right now, it's kind of an interesting time in the industry because uh, you don't have a lot of companies in the game trying to kill each other and, and break each other and, and compete and, and put each other down. It's almost more a fraternity. We uh, spend a lot of time with the folks over at Sony. We spend a lot of time with the folks over at Valve. Anyone who's serious about VR uh, sort of is in this strange uh, moment of time, sort of a band of brothers and sisters who are trying to make this happen because they have uh, so much excitement for, for the medium. So here's an image of Crescent Bay. One of the new things about Crescent Bay is that we've started to integrate audio. So virtual reality is not a visual system. Virtual reality is not a visual plus audio system. Virtual reality is a series of systems that will replace uh, your, your proprioception and allow you to feel like you're really somewhere else. And so that's why I say years down the road, we'll look back and realize virtual reality is not DK1. I think we already realized that. But it's, it's also not even Crescent Bay. However, with Crescent Bay, you can see that we're starting to move beyond the visual system. So audio is a huge benefit to a good VR experience. Our vision is that we want people to be able to close their eyes, enjoy a soundscape, look around, and then open their eyes and find that it's exactly what they expected. So virtual reality is, is really just uh, replacing your senses with something that is artificial, but that feels very real. Let's talk about the SDK really quickly. What is it? Is it really a black box? The magic of VR is that it doesn't require a fundamental shift in how you're doing your work as a developer. So we have direct mode rendering. This is one of the greatest software enha enhancements that's ever happened since the beginning of Oculus. It used to be that we handed out the SDK. We had people deal with their own distortion parameters, uh, their own chromatic aberration algorithms. Uh, we basically said, hey, it's the Wild West. Do what you think is right. And as a result, we saw really wildly varying results. Some experiences would be fantastic on the experience design, but they would be absolutely horrible on how they integrated the SDK. Others would be uh, a horrible design, but get the, the comfort exactly right because of uh, hitting you know, distortion exactly the right way. So the nice thing is we, we do now support display mirroring, uh, which was a big complaint when we first launched DK2. Um, and basically, it, it allows you to only have to worry about passing through the correct left and right eye cameras, and we handle all of the rendering for you. Latency testing. So did anyone buy a latency tester in here? Excellent, we got one person. I wish I had a prize to give you. We didn't sell a ton of latency testers. A lot of people just sort of didn't care about performance. Um, and so what happened is it just wasn't very practical. You had to actually unscrew your eye cup and then screw in this latency tester, and it was rather finicky. It was up to the developer to test and then update and optimize their code. And what we've done now with the four, starting with the 4.0 SDK is we're automating latency testing and reaction. So we have dynamic latency calculation and predictive, um, uh, what is it, adaptive prediction. It's a mouthful. So basically what's happening is we used to have a setting where you would need to predict what the latency of your title was. And the complication with that is that if you were going to deliver a, a VR experience or a, or, or a VR app to end users, they might have a very wide range of, of hardware and software systems that you would have to be compatible with. Someone might have a GeForce 7, 780 and another person might have a GeForce 980. And so a hard setting for prediction would not work, at least not well, unless you match the exact configuration of, of what the development system was. So now we have adaptive prediction, which basically samples the uh, top right pixel in your rendered frame. We timestamp it and then allow for uh, the prediction to match your system performance as a user. Pixel luminance overdrive. One of the things about low persistence is that it, it created this sense that the scene was darker. The luminance of the display was not as bright because not as much time was being spent in actually rendering or, or turning the pixel on. And so what we've done for this, starting with the 
4.0 SDK is we're doing overdrive. So the previous method here, we had a two-frame a two delay, uh, basically, where if you went from black to white, we would uh, just send the signal to the display panel that it needed to be at a 255 white. Uh, and now what happens is we actually send an over, over gain or overdrive si signal to the display panel to allow for the brightness to be um, where you expect it to be in less time. And this is something that you get for free. Field of view. <clears throat> the SDK uh, basically takes care of field of view for you. There are things that you can do to miniaturize a world or to make it seem uh, very large. However, for most cases, you're just going to want to go with the field of view that we offer. And uh, if you've seen a bad field of view implementation, it feels as though you're a fish or some sort of reptile. Uh, Everything looks right at the first moment, but then you start to look around, and on the edges you see in the peripheral vision tons of, of movement and motion, and things look very small on the screen, and it's super uncomfortable. You can, I mean, there are some things you can do in VR that just instantly will make people sick. It, uh, it could be used for a torture device, um, and I've, I've actually been tortured by some of the content that I've seen before. Um, fortunately, it wasn't uh, malicious. It was benign. <laughs> Time warp. Time warp is very interesting. This is a new technology created by John Carmack and team. Time warp effectively allows you to uh, gracefully recover from dropped frames. So we do, we do require as a standard that, for example, in Crescent Bay, you want to have 90 frames per second. However, we all know that games uh, have variable performance issues. And so if you do end up dropping a frame, time warp will help you to uh, reduce the impact of the judder and, and the stuttering that happens, and effectively it will uh, render you, uh, the scene in a different orientation that allows for that to feel a little bit more smooth. It cannot solve a low frame rate problem. You can't have a, a game that runs at 60 frames per second and just suddenly bump it up to 90 uh, based on frame interpolation using time warp. It won't happen. So it really is meant to be a rescue mechanism, but it really makes a big difference. And uh, we're excited that with the mobile Gear VR product, we have asynchronous time warp running, which uses its own thread for, for time warp processing. So uh, this is just a summary. I think we've already uh, talked about SDK rendering. Now, um, the other thing that's really exciting is we're working with game engine companies. And I would, I would probably estimate that 80 plus percent of the content that we've ever seen is Unity-based. And then, uh, you know, behind that, uh, it would be epic-oriented uh, or epic-created content. We're working with both companies. We have support for uh, UE th UE3, UE4, and the UDK from Epic. We also have support for the Unity engine all the way up to 5.0. So how is designing for VR different? What does it require? Comfort is the key. If you have a VR experience or game that is absolutely stunningly beautiful and it runs at 20 frames per second, users will hands down 100% of the time pick an experience that's a polygonal world, low graphic fidelity, low graphic quality, but that runs at full frame rate. Because comfort really does either allow you to stay in or it'll force you to come out. Sensory hints help a lot. If you are um, flying in an aircraft uh, and you're trying to counterbalance the mismatch between our vestibular system, which says, I'm sitting in a chair, and the visual system, which says, I'm turning at a 25 degree bank, creating visual cues to help that uh, can go a long way. So for example, if I'm driving in a car and I have a little uh, keychain or, or some kind of trinket dangling from my rear view mirror, and then as I turn on a bank, the keychain sort of swings to the right, you can, you can leverage cues like that in the content to help offset the vestibular mismatch. So ultimately what needs to happen is you have to ground your player in the experience. They're putting on something that completely replaces one of their senses. They're moving into a different world. The cognitive load of going into a virtual reality system is, is inherently higher. And so we want to make that experience comfortable for someone. FPSs are actually very difficult. It's really interesting that the first titles that were ported to VR or created for VR were first-person shooters. Uh, Team Fortress, 
2, uh, Half-Life 2. These are, these are games and experiences which, although very exciting and, and very beautiful in some ways, were absolutely horrible for, for a VR experience. Uh, if any, has anyone in here run at 40 miles per hour? Or maybe has anyone done like a rocket jump or um, jumped from here over to like the lunch line laterally? It just doesn't happen. And the funny thing is that people sort of attributed the sickness to VR. And it probably, well, it may have something to do with VR, but certainly there's a big part of it that has to do with the fact that if you did that in real life, you would be sick. VR actually mimics uh, reality quite well. UI is a big challenge. Uh, just, just in terms of porting an experience to VR, if you have a UI that's not made ready for VR, even if it's just a menu system to get into a level or an experience, it's really uncomfortable. Um, and so the ideal is not to force people to do a menu and then later put the headset on. You should think about an experience from beginning to end being made for VR. Uh, additionally, UI is going to require a new, a new thought process. We need to think about how to remove UI because things are more obvious now. Things are more possible with VR. If you can turn your head around a corner in order to see something, then perhaps you can create an indicator around the corner rather than having an arrow in 3D space or something like this. So it's not a hard rule, but as a general rule of thumb, the more UI you can remove, the more intuitive a, a experience becomes. Reality is not presence. The uncanny valley is magnified by VR. So if you don't have the, the production chops to make something realistic really look realistic, it's going to come off as cheesy and, and canned. And so the impetus is really not on creating the world's most realistic experience. It's just on creating the world's most entertaining and comfortable and desirable experience in VR. OK, so I promised that with, uh, with the talk today, I would provide three good examples and three bad examples. So let's start off with the wins. Number one, Lucky's Tale. Why, why is this a win? I want to break this down into uh, sort of a categorical or, or uh, a material reason. Lucky's Tale was interesting because it was the first platformer, third-person platformer, that we really invested seriously in. And my favorite VR experience, hands down, is the intro scene to Lucky's Tale. It's not even the game. There's something magical about these, these vignettes where you can explore a world. And Lucky's Tale sort of changed the way that we thought about um, head tracking because as the intro to the game, they basically provide the whole world there for you. And you can look around, and you can, you can move, and you can zoom in and see different things happening. And you, you get sort of a preview of what your experience is going to be. Previews are very interesting because it will apply to film, it will apply to entertainment, it will apply to academia. You can create an experience for someone where there's then familiarity later on when they're there in a first-person perspective. Win number two, one of my personal favorites from our VR Jam last year was the game called Alone. Alone was very progressive because it created this, uh, it, it was almost inception for VR. There was a screen within a screen, so um, creating virtual experiences that mimic things happening in the real world can, can become very immersive. And then what they did is layered on this sort of horror experience behind the scenes that uh, felt very real and, and very visceral. So um, looking at a screen in virtual reality can actually have some benefit. And creating these faux reality experiences can allow you to transport your users to the 70s or to the Roman period or to the time of the dinosaurs. So this is something that's very exciting about VR and, and really is an advantage of the medium. Number three would be Valkyrie. It's an obvious one. I chose the obvious ones, the easy ones. But the thing that's interesting about Valkyrie is you can't replicate that experience on a 2D screen. It's a great pr uh, proof point. They use gaze. Uh, head gaze for gameplay. So you can lock on to other enemies or do other types of weapon systems by moving your head around. And so it introduces uh, a, a pretty narrow learning curve. There is some learning curve there. But it fundamentally augments the experience for a VR user. Let's talk about a couple of examples for the textbook. Now, these are not all around bad games. As a matter of fact, some of these are very, very good games on a 2D monitor. 
we're talking about lessons that we've learned through uh, our time developing for virtual reality. Number one would be Hawken. And Hawken had what I call the painted egg syndrome. So I found this picture of, a, of an egg that someone had painted with a likeness of some guy. And you know, at, at, the, at the onset, you might look at this picture and think, oh, that looks like a 3D guy. But as you rotate the egg, especially if the inside of the egg were painted, you would realize that the image was flat. And so what happened with Hawken is they had these very beautiful um, cockpits, but the geometry was fundamentally simple. And they leveraged things like um, shadow techniques and, and normal maps and things like that to, to create a sense of depth for a 2D panel. That works great for a screen, but then once you go into it in VR, you're looking around and everything feels very cheesy because you feel like you're inside of a bubble that's just been painted with a texture. So geometry uh, complexity is very important and actually helps stereoscopy to pop. Example number two. Um, Actually, one of my favorite games, and I think that they're going to solve a lot of the problems still, I know they're working on it, is Among the Sleep. The reason Among the Sleep had one of the lessons that we've learned uh, integrated into it was that they fundamentally took control of your face. And you never want to take control of somebody's face and perspective in a VR experience. In this particular example in Among the Sleep, the mother picks you up, you're starting from a laying position even though you're, you're sitting uh, upright in a chair, and she carries you up the stairs. You're going backwards, you're moving all around the place, but it doesn't correlate with your head movements. And so that's very problematic, and, and we actually have a very good relationship with them and have talked about ways to solve that. Not all the answers are, are completely solved yet, but this is something that we're working on. This is one of the worst things you can do in VR is take uh, control of someone's perception. Number three would be VR Coaster. The reason why is because there's a ton of acceleration. There are a lot of problems with changes in direction, with ascent, descent. And uh, there's also a mismatch between the orientation of your head and the orientation of the track. So fundamentally, what I would break it down to is acceleration. We thought at the beginning of uh, our journey that acceleration would be wonderful and that the rate of speed is what would cause people to have problems. And it's actually quite the opposite. If you do acceleration for a very short burst, you can create experiences that have that, that feeling, that give you that, that oomph. But um, if you do acceleration for extended periods of time or deceleration or rapid changes in direction, you can really make people uncomfortable. So there's a ton of room for innovation. This really is the very early stages of, of virtual reality as a viable consumer platform. And there's a lot more to explore. There's a lot more to learn. What we ask is that you invest in building teams. We can help you. We can do matchmaking. We want you to engage with us and provide feedback. One of the benefits, I think, of virtual reality in the 2000s versus the 90s or the 80s is that we have a very vibrant and active and communicative community out there. Um, and then the last thing, obviously, is rely on us. We released an SDK that uh, was fundamentally different for DK2, and it, it provided fundamental support, but it had a lot of problems. We knew it. The community helped us. And uh, in exchange, we released new, new updates to solve a lot of the problems that we had run into. But uh, it's, it's moving very, very fast. If you think about the history here, it was E3 of 2012 when John Carmack and Palmer showed their first prototype. The Kickstarter was at the end of 2012. DK1 was less than two years ago. And so if you think about all the different manifestations of products that, that you've seen come from Oculus and from other companies in VR, it's just an absolutely wickedly fast uh, rate of acceleration and, and speed at which virtual reality is maturing. And we couldn't be more excited about it. So thank you for being involved, and thanks for coming to my talk. If there are any questions, I'll field them now. I test shout. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, I'm Elena Arponen from Prime One, two. Um, so, okay, thanks. Uh, so we've actually created a new genre of uh, multiplayer story games, and we are very interested to take that, uh, that genre also to the VR. Uh, my question is that you also, uh, at some point, announced that you are building a virtual world, a bit like a Second Life or, or something like that, where people can go and roam around. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Um, you know, the, I, I think what you're referring to is probably some mention of the metaverse. We're interested in creating the metaverse, right? Um, we do have teams that are focused on what it takes to build the metaverse. 
we're not necessarily trying to create a second life, at least nothing that we've announced yet. Um, you know, we do think that social, in, um, social interactions in VR are one of the most exciting things that can happen. Uh, and, and you can get a glimpse of that with something like the Minecraft mod that allows you to make eye contact with someone else in virtual reality. It's a fundamentally new experience. It's really exciting. So the focus is really more on what are the elements or what are the interactions that make a, a persistent online universe interesting? And then once all of those things are sort of proven out by prototyping, then you know maybe we'll we'll focus on building the metaverse out. But we haven't announced like the metaverse will arrive 2016 or something like that. You know, so it's it's of interest, but uh, nothing necessarily uh, material is going to be showing up anytime soon. Question: Anyone? Can you tell us anything on the? Uh on the retail side, I mean, uh, when it's coming out, uh, pricing, stuff like that? Sure. So uh, this year, as I mentioned before Christmas, Gear VR will be released publicly as a consumer product. Uh, on the PC side, we do have developer kits that are available right now, but we haven't made any announcements about uh, consumer version. So we do feel like we're getting closer. The Crescent Bay prototype is definitely a, a landmark achievement and feels very comfortable, but we haven't made any announcement about price or availability for the PC product. So for right now, if you're really looking to monetize and engage with consumers, Gear VR is your best bet. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. What about the usage of other accessories, like a treadmill, gloves? Is that recommended, or is like you use only the Xbox controller and that's it, or, or what? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think that the challenge with accessories is that if they're not perfectly tuned, if you don't have sub-millimeter accuracy, as we do with the vision system, what happens is a flaw in performance of something like a, a wand, right? If, if you're in VR and you're looking at your hands and you see them there because you're holding this wand and you're moving it around, if you see glitches happen or, or something's not exactly right, it leaves actually an impression by association that the whole system is broken. The whole system is flawed somehow. So there are interesting areas for research that, that I think a lot of people are working in uh, and that you know we're investigating as well. But I haven't yet seen anything that really feels like a complement uh, a powerful complement to the visual system. So over time, I think things will change. I, I think things will be produced. But for right now, I don't think that there's anything out there that really magnifies that VR experience and creates a, a really comfortable sense of, um, of you know, intuitive VR immersion. Well, that's it. Aaron, thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you very much.